Uh, it's like a dream come true for all of us because uh, we are planning to bring a national seminar to our college and last year we applied for the fund and this year we got the grant and Honey Ma'am was very enthusiastic and also Senior was uh, very enthusiastic about the project and uh, they went ahead uh, with the project and they uh, got a very relevant topic from our studies. And I'm happy that uh, I'm, uh, we have got uh, with us today Dr. Samuel Rufus, sir. Uh, he is uh, an old colleague of mine. Uh, I had uh, an opportunity to work with him at Madras Christian College back in 2008. A very short stint. Uh, if I were to narrate all his achievement, it would take one hour. So uh, I'm not going to do that. Instead. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome him uh, to our small college, small gathering. He has taken a wonderful topic, trauma, epistemic violence and archive. Uh, I think uh, it would be a wonderful experience for all of us to listen to uh, one of the scholars in this area. So uh, I invite you. Thank you all. Good morning. It's so, I'm so happy and privileged to be here this morning with you, especially the topic of the seminar. You know, uh, on trauma studies. Not many have ventured into this area uh, or forayed into this area for years. And I am thankful to the organizers, especially my very good friend, uh, Professor Pradi Pariharan, uh, here, Professor Hani Sabu, and all the organizers for having invited me here. So, my talk is basically on trauma, epistemic violence, and the archive. So I have traced it in three parameters. One is, you know, um, the epistemic violence is something, a term that Gayatri Spivak has used. And archival fever or archive, you know, the power in the archives is used by Derrida as such. And I will talk about how post-colonial trauma studies has been left out of mainstream trauma literary studies and how some of the yardsticks of trauma literary studies have not addressed these post-colonial aspects and then move on to how epistemic violence has affected the archives and give you some instances from the texts that I'm going to discuss, a few texts that I'm going to discuss, how post-colonial literary uh, working of trauma has been so therapeutic for the writers the poets or the authors, and uh, how they grapple with trauma in their own social, cultural, economic context. And finally, I also give a call or a plea to uh, trauma literary studies in general. This is how I have structured my right, talk this morning. So uh, let me begin with the uh, uh, premise when in the year 1995, when uh, we had that wonderful essay, you know, Trauma, Knowledge and Literary Studies by Geoffrey Hartman, it began a beautiful vista on how trauma could be connected with literature. Of course, the others were there from Yale University, you know, uh, Kathy Carroll and others were there. But still, this essay was uh, a clinching factor on how trauma could be connected with literary studies. You know, Geoffrey Hartman's 1995, that wonderful essay. And uh, ever since, you've got a whole lot of rapid strides connecting trauma with the literature. Unfortunately, it is unfortunate, I would say, that most of these representations of trauma have always emanated from a Westocentric perspective. Most of these uh, parameters, these yardsticks that have, we have been having on trauma literary studies, the rubrics that govern trauma literary studies, has been very Westocentric. And so, post-colonial nation states have always had their own versions of trauma, have always had their own quotas of trauma that have always been sidelined, you know, considered negligible, marginalized and suppressed, or if I do use the words of Franz Fanon, oppressed. They've always been at the receiving end because 
You know, it was the center that spoke. And the center here happens to be, you know, the West. And so post-colonial literary studies, you know, even the word trauma literary studies or the phrase trauma literary studies has a lot of, you know, the definition goes something like this. It's an interdisciplinary study that connects with Western scholarship, psychology, you know, and humanities, you know, connected with Western scholarship because it is they who started it. And today, if you look at trauma studies in general, what comes to our mind spontaneously? Obviously, you know, the Western framework, the hegemonic framework of knowledge, mostly centered on the Holocaust, right? And other traumatic experiences connected with, you know, the American wars, especially the Vietnam War, the World War, where the West was impacted or affected. Franz Fanon, when he wrote his Wretched of the Earth, <coughs> there, you know, um, he was giving us a very impactful study on the psychological effects of trauma on the colonized. You know, Franz Fanon, we all know, he's supposed to be the progenitor of post-colonial studies per se. Right? After that, Edward Said came in 1978 and he wrote his wonderful book, Orientalism. But it all started with Franz Fanon, who was a psychiatrist from Algeria. And he was, he was an ordinary psychiatrist. He was going his own way. When suddenly on a train on the Paris metro, as we all know, he encountered a very traumatic event, he says. It was a traumatic event for him because, you know, there he experienced a little girl who, was, who found him obnoxious, who found him hateful. Because everyone in the compartment in the metro were white, but he was a black. So the moment she shouted at him, like as if she was very afraid of him, he says, it was for the first time I experienced a psychological trauma within myself. And this experience led him to discontinue his PhD that he was doing under Sigmund Freud, that he was working on Freud, because he was also a psychiatrist. And so he said, I discontinued my studies, my PhD, and then started looking at the pejorative or the negative effects of trauma on the psyche of the colonized. So he says, for the first time, I thought or I was made to feel that I was an object. See, this is a trauma from the colonized perspective. You know what's the meaning of an objectified, right? An object cannot speak for itself. An object cannot talk or reason out or justify for herself, for himself or itself because its identity has already been given to it. A name has already been given to this object. So when a person is objectified, be it a girl, be it a boy, when they are objectified, that means they become nameless mass or a nameless entity without any validation, without any agency. And that is what happened to Franz Fanon, he says. From then on, he started analyzing the psychological effects of trauma and how they have become victims in their own land because of the process of colonization. How stereotypes impacted or affected the subject. Stereotypes about the colonized. How they had a traumatic effect on the victimized, that is the colonized or the oppressed. From then on, Franz Fanon, you know, uh, I think it was... <clears throat> Jean-Paul Sartre, who gave the wonderful introduction to uh, The Wretched of the Earth, 1961 book. We must all read. It was in French, translated into English. Sartre gave the introduction to the book where he talks about, you know, this uh, objectification. He says, you know, uh, we look upon them as chained, scarred creatures. We, in the sense, the whites look upon the blacks. You know, as chained and scarred creatures. Remember, the, the traumatic experience for the West was predominantly based on the mind. But the traumatic experiences for the East or for the colonized was necessarily somatic. S-O-M-A-T-I-C. Somatic means bodily. The scars. The pain. The angst that they experienced was more somatic than psychological. And this is not accommodated 
in the rubric to trauma studies because you know bodily trauma is equally an effective re rendition that has been sidelined so he, you know sartre in the introduction to the book he talks about this you know this somatic aspect to trauma and how the victim is not able to speak for herself or himself from the colonized perspective there are various streams of trauma that are so peculiar to the post colonial nation states i'm just going to discuss a few of them quickly before i come to the conclusion we have uh, you know if you have heard of the word geriatric trauma geriatric trauma in the sense uh, uh, the word geriatric means connected with old age or uh, gerontology social workers would have used the word gerontology the study of old people the elders you know the problems connected with elders if you type out geriatric trauma on the internet even the master searching engine, engine for us google will not give you any answers because geriatric trauma has been conveniently ignored sidelined marginalized especially in the context of the post colonial fabric when we have a not a nuclear family when we have a you know a larger family set up made up of grandparents you know even sometimes great grandparents living in our houses right and it's a joint family set up we have so there is this wonderful story 1989 story by a telugu writer aburi chaya devi it's titled the wood rose it's a wonderful story uh, i don't know if you have read it it's translated into english it was first published in andhra jodi we have a lot of translated you know stories available in, in chennai you know? so i tend to read it and there in the story there is a wonderful rendition of this geriatric trauma there is a woman who becomes old she has a only son gopalan and this gopalan marries a girl this girl comes into the house and very soon this old woman this mother in law teaches her everything about the house very soon she learns to master all the things that the husband needs and so she is a very docile woman in the house the mother in law supervises everything in the house teaches her the abc's of housekeeping and over a period of time this woman ages she becomes senile she becomes an octogenarian 80 plus now the she is made to sit in the you know portico or in the in, a, in that balcony of the house that is her position in the house that is her place in the house she is not given any other place she is senile she is immobile imbecile she can't move she is made to sit in the portico and then you find there is this uh, uh, daughter in law comes gives her some chai gives her some dosa whatever she gives she has to take she can't move she can't ask anything she has become a very passive numb creature according to you know the story writer chaya devi and one day as she was sitting in the you know that uh, beautiful balcony of her house which which was her permanent residence she can't go anywhere inside the house when she was sitting there her daughter in law planted a beautiful wood rose plant it was a kind of a plant that grows beautifully gives a wonderful shade very soon it grows climbs and gives a beautiful shade so this plant was planted there this mother in law first didn't like the plant but very soon because she thought it was her fate to be with the plant she liked her. you know she empathized to the plant sympathized to the plant and so the plant grew up and very soon the plant you know covered that area so that the sun's light couldn't enter in so this old woman 80 plus woman started empathizing loving the plant she was so besotted with the plant one day gopalan comes into the house looks at the balcony and he sees this plant as mushroom like anything then without asking anybody he just takes a huge pair of you know scissors uh, the, the the garden scissors and he you know cuts down the plant not caring not considering whether his mother was affected by that incident but this incident left too deep a scar on the mother it it, it you know according to chaya dev it was a traumatic scar for the mother because she felt her, a part of her own limb was being cut down and tears rolled down her eyes and she immediately goes back to glimpses of the past when gopalan was a little boy in her house 
she thinks about those reveries those memories she thinks to herself when he was a little boy he was my only son he used to tell me amma when i grow up i will see to it that you are a queen when i grow up i will see to it you you have everything in the house you will have a servants you will have all things with you then she comes back to the present the harsh reality is this the same son is this the same gopalan who promised me the moon when he was a kid and uh, tears rolled down her eyes this incident this incident was beautifully you know towards the end it is so pathetic when you see you know this woman not able to you know even question her son she's so afraid she's so you know beyond shock to ask him anything and so she ends the story beautifully again how many incidences of geriatric trauma have been sidelined marginalized in mainstream literary trauma studies if you key in geriatric trauma studies on the web i'm sure you will not get even 10 results these are supposed to be exclusively the domain of post colonial nation states where you have the elderly living with us right in a in a kind of a joint family setup and these instances of the elderly traumatized and not able to express their agony to anyone how many of us have spoken about that how many of us have given vent to their anger voice to their suppression teeth to their oppression it has not been done i'm so happy you know i again and again i congratulate the department for having come out with this thoughtful endeavor on trauma studies where you know you you represent a, a facet of uh, of you know a topic that has been underrepresented in society and the next instance i would like to you know talk about is trauma of alienation i would like to quote from uh, salman rushdie's wonderful book imaginary homelands right Uh, he has written a wonderful book it's a collection of essays he uh, talks about the emergency he talks about his friends rk narayan he talks about mulkraj anand he is very finicky about rk narayan and very open in his comments in the first chapter there you know he talks about uh, imaginary homelands the title of the first chapter is also imaginary homelands there he talks about this trauma of alienation you know he says what this this sentence really moved me he says what does it mean to be an indian outside of india you know some of us might have experienced that right what does it mean to be an indian outside of india have you ever thought of that when just imagine for example you and i all of us here you know are now are now in you know washington dc and then we are thinking about our home back in trishu what will be our perspective towards trishu you know this is called the double bind gayatri spivak uses the term called the double bind double bind means you know it's not a dilemma your heart is elsewhere but your mind is in some other place a double bind scenario where you your affinities are on either side back home in trishur also you have your affinities at the same time you are here in the land of somebody else somebody else is ruling not your own flesh and blood and in this land caught between the dilemma of two knowledges two cultures two you know uh, languages it, what is the situation how traumatic is it when you are alienated from your own society of course you have benjamin writing about a whole lot of writers you know immigrant writers writing about the experience of alienation how traumatic is it i'm not trying to connect it to the diasporic experience that is a different experience altogether the trauma of alienation when you go you know and you are exiled from your homeland like you know some of the writers from the caribbean some of the writers from the uh, the african uh, nation states like uh, when they go to uh, america or they you know as slaves 
how do they reflect on their experiences and i would say with all assurance that the way post colonial poets or writers have given vent to this experience is so phenomenal they browbeat or they even overtake their american western counterparts in that best experiences i would say you know the the manifestation in the form of songs a traumatic event is given vent to in the form of songs as therapy because when i go back to freud right he talks about free association or speech therapy you know how the doctrine of free association helps people to come out of their you know traumatic event with the with the help of a good therapist actually right and so you know when i try to connect it with how post colonial writers try to come out with their angst with a trauma in the form of a therapy writing becomes therapy for them to freud writing is the expression of the libidinal instinct but here to the post colonial writer writing becomes therapy in itself like freud says no when he says a traumatic event is re lived or re narrated he says it should be like this you know imagine you are sitting at the window to a train right at the window on a train on a long journey he says a traumatized patient if she has to come out of her trauma she has to relive that experience and narrate all the incidents in sequence she should not hide anything like you narrate incidents when you sit at the window and describe all the incidents on your train journey only then therapy becomes an effective administrative tool similarly for the post colonial writer writing becomes therapy when kamala das talks about a wonderful phrase in her poem introduction the language that i speak becomes mine isn't it right the language that i speak becomes mine that means when i speak my language i am proud of it because it becomes therapy the same experience you find in the caribbean writers in the african writers in the african american writers who never succumb to the charms of the english language they have always tried to tinge their version of english that is a creole with the master's version of english because the language that i use becomes mine and traumatic events when they are relived if it is going to be artificial it cannot be a sequencing as you find in a train journey it will be concocted when it is concocted the truth doesn't normally come out like uh, virginia wolf talks in a stream of consciousness technique it's a sprinkling of thoughts and emotions like henry james says about the stream of consciousness technique like ulysses you find the stream of it is just a sprinkling of thoughts and emotions the moment you are true to yourself you don't contrive or concoct a language the language comes spontaneously to you and the language that i speak becomes mine and so language there for him is a natural language that is based on a sculpture tiongo when he wrote the is wonderful work decolonizing the mind isn't it decolonizing the mind he says don't decolonize you know the place more than decolonizing the place decolonizing the mind is very important he was writing in english i i i remember this january he was in indian habitat center uh, new delhi some of us were there listening to him he was 80 plus he is 80 plus and see the conviction with which he spoke he says language carries culture and in culture lies my identity so if i speak the queen's english i am reflecting the queen's culture not my culture if i am speaking the queen's language that means i am reflecting the identity of the englishman not mine so he says the english language doesn't represent my culture if i have to be true to myself if i have to be spontaneous if it has to be a stream of consciousness for a in my writing i should be myself and if i have to be myself he says i should write in my mother tongue from then on he took a resolve he will not write in english and he says 
past horrible experiences traumatic experience that i have been through cannot be relived unless it is through my mother tongue and he started writing in gikuyu g i k i y u gikuyu is his native tongue he stopped writing in english but he speaks you know good english when he came here you know he was speaking very well in english and he was asking us even spivak that day she told us read translated works you will get the feel of various cultures and their angst their agonies read more of translation she said and this is what you know the caribbean writers do they have their own variety of language they don't write the queen's english none of the caribbean writers none of the african writers they write the queen's english chinuachbi also wanted to narrate the traumatic past of colonization on their lives so he said i appreciate uh, tiongo let him not write in english full appreciation for him regard for him let him not write in english but i will write in english and you ask him why he says yes the reason is if i have to reach the world with the power of my pen if i have to tell the world about the angst the trauma of colonization on me and my people i will have to write in english otherwise who will know the language of the subaltern the voice of the suppressed the voice of the victimized but he gives a rider you know what he says he says i will use english but a wonderful expression he gives he says i will use the master's own tools to dismantle the master's own house that means i will use the same hammer and tongs and things that he has with the same hammer i will dismantle his own house i will write my own variety of english and that's why things fall apart in his works you will find the english is not the queen's english deliberate deviations from mainstream you know uh, that uh, normative english you will find in a chinu achbi and that is the beauty of writing back if trauma has to be relived it has to be spontaneous like narrating an experience through the window of a train it has to be done through a spontaneous equally spontaneous language and for that the language should not be a made up language it should be spontaneous like kamala das says the language that i speak becomes mine another experience of trauma you know connected with it, it's called chromatic trauma chromatic trauma in the sense the word chromatism means color like geriatric trauma like uh, the trauma of alienation chromatic you won't find that on the internet i suggest i i i challenge you right chromatic the word chromatism means the politics of color how it traumatizes an objectified subject how it traumatizes thank you sir how it traumatizes the objectified subject homi baba talks about how 100 plus layers of color were attributed to the colonized based on their color you know they had different uh, layers of color chromatism is the politics of color there are the politics of you know representation through color there were different strata in color colors also right so it is not necessarily white and black or white and dark even among dark there were various shades of dark and based on that they were given responsibilities in society a hierarchical representation of color and this is called chromatic trauma we find in dreams from my father by barack obama you know he was called barry then you must read this wonderful book dreams from my father by barack obama i have read it twice and still you know you will on you know normally by default uh, tears will come down your cheeks when you read uh, this wonderful book he was a senator back then when he wrote this book but this book is so impactful in the sense it gives you the 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 trauma of being a colored person in their own land that's the irony he narrates an incident you know he narrates a very you know pathetic incident when he and his sister both of them went to a kenyan restaurant it's not an american restaurant it's a kenyan restaurant they went there for their food for the morning breakfast 
what happened was he says you know he talks about you know the the horrifying ex- experience that he encountered there when there was a black uh, you know person who was serving them who was taking orders he came to the table he asked them what they wanted and then he left after that some white people came there and this you know this black server again the skinny and native he went to them asked them spoke to them and he made sure they got everything he completely ignored ba- barry barry in the sense he was called barry then barack obama right he completely disregarded or ignored barry and his sister this was not for 5 minutes 10 minutes half an hour one hour more than one hour he was ignored his sister felt very bad humiliated the whites were completely you know catered to where they were very hospitable to the whites and then you know uh, barack obama he was passively sitting there like the experience that fanon had in the paris metro he was passively sitting there but his sister was very angry you know what she did she opened her purse threw out all the money she had on the floor of that hotel and she said do you think me nigga don't have money such is the angst such is the trauma of being a victim in your own society because of the politics of color and he says that incident left a deep scar that is why post colonial traumas are not necessarily that of the mind it is more of somatic it is more related to the body to the color right to the scars that have become the you know by default a part of the post colonial you know uh, subject and you know he talks about that even later that uh, the politics of color that was practiced in kenya his own land even today we find this politics is practiced sham selvin in his wonderful you know a uh, uh, narration he talks about two boys are there one is a white boy one is a black boy both of them are going to a mango orchard to steal mangoes so there is a black boy who says don't steal it but the white boy says come let's have some fun and he goes ahead steal some mangoes put them in his pockets and he starts running the black boy doesn't do anything there he doesn't commit a crime but the landlord comes running behind them and he catches hold of the black boy he doesn't even you know worry himself about the white boy the black boy is so pathetic selvan says you know he's so pathetic he looks up at the landlord and says the landlord ironically is a black and he looks at the landlord and says master i did not steal i did not steal i didn't even touch the mango i didn't i didn't even touch go near the orchard and this guy is standing at the far distance and looking with glee at him he doesn't even accuse the white boy but he says i did not steal but you know what the black landlord says he gives him one huge whacking and he says don't tell lies don't tell lies to me white people can never lie white people can never lie a stereotype that silences the truth edward said says you know he defines stereotypes like this a stereotype is something that gains the validity of truth by being repeated over and over and over and over again a stereotype is not truth but it gains the validity of truth by being repeated over and over and over and over again so over a period of time some stereotypes have been given to us that this is good this is bad and stereotypes don't have an iota of truth to it they are all falsified versions of reality they are all concocted contrived versions of reality but we still believe in those stereotypes and how these stereotypes affect the post colonial subject in his own land 
That is what you know, Barack Obama says. And how do they give back? How do they you know, uh, use writing as therapy to rise above these traumatic incidents? Paul Lawrence Dunbar, you all must have known, right? That wonderful uh, writer in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, uh, he was the guru of Langston Hughes, if I should use the word guru. Right? He was the mentor for Langston Hughes. He, in his wonderful little poem, Sympathy, he talks about, I know why the caged bird sings. Remember, this phrase was borrowed by Maya Angelou. Right? She used this phrase, I know why the caged bird sings. But it was originally used by Dunbar. He talks about the traumatic existence of a post-colonial black objectified subject as living inside a cage. He doesn't have an existence of his own. Just imagine this. A bird inside a cage, can it fly out? No. A bird inside a cage, can it go and take the food that she wants? No. A bird inside the cage, can it go wherever she wants? No. And in this beautiful little poem, Sympathy, you can see, you know, what um, Langston Hughes called it later, the traumatic angst of the victimized mind. The traumatic angst of a victimized mind. Look at that. And he says, I am a caged bird, completely robbed of my wings. My wings have been clipped for their own selfish reasons. They have curtailed me from speaking. You know that wonderful essay by Gayatri Spivak in the year 1985, Can the Subaltern Speak? The subaltern here again, the oppressed, cannot speak because you know the voice has been muted. Even if she speaks, she cannot be heard. Right? Can the subaltern be heard? That's the next line. But still he says, as a subject with my own identity, I need to bring forth my voice. This concept of voice in tra literary trauma studies is very important. Voice is a very dominant feature that comes again and again in you know, these uh, trauma literary studies or literary trauma studies. Here you find you know, how he says, although I am muted, although I have been victimized, still I will try to fly. And he tries to fly, you know, the cage, the, the gilded cage. So, the, what happens is, blood oozes out of the wings because the whole place is gilded, the cage is gilded. Again, he tries to fly. Again, you know, the wings hurt a lot, blood oozes out. He doesn't stop at that. Again, he tries to fly. Again, blood oozes out. You know what he says towards the end? I know I might die trying to fly, but still I will bring forth my voice. I will still echo the painful, traumatic lives that we have led through my voice. Because he says, if I don't speak for me, who else will? If I don't represent myself, who if I don't represent myself, who else will? And this is exactly what is happening to literary trauma studies where you find voices are underrepresented or spoken for by a Westocentric medium. This is what Gayatri Spiva calls epistemic violence. That's the second part of the speech. Epistemic violence is the word episteme we all know comes from Foucault, right? Michel Foucault gives us that word epistemic, episteme. Knowledge frameworks. How have they come to us? You Knowing that power knowledge, wonderful work, he says, power and knowledge are always related. So when one knowledge is subjugated, he gives a beautiful phrase there. We need an insurrection of subjugated knowledges. This is what he says, Foucault. An insurrection of subjugated knowledges. Connecting that with Raymond Williams when he says about dominant knowledges, 
emergent knowledges and residual knowledges you know uh, uh, raymond williams here you find dominant knowledges you know oppressing the subjugated knowledges there are knowledges that are so unique to my culture there are knowledges that have a aura of their own but they are subjugated because of an epistemic violence spivak says and what is this epistemic violence this epistemic violence is a forceful violation of another knowledge and imposing my knowledge on yours when american literature was introduced into india back in the 90s before that we didn't have american literature you know how it was introduced they offered full funding if you conducted a conference on american literature full funding and professors from uh, india they are, they were given exchange programs to go to america if they did work on american literature of course to be honest even canadian literature does that right uh, way back in the 1990s if you worked on canadian literature they gave you free exchange programs you can go there live there for 3 years do your phd and come back even today many universities right saskatchewan many universities offer that how dominant knowledges they force themselves into the curricula through power and this power knowledge framework is what foucault asks us to be aware of spivak talks about this power knowledge framework as an epistemic violence when local narratives of trauma are sub or subsumed or sidelined or underrepresented if i don't talk about the trauma at my own backyard who else will there are a host of traumas in my society that is so unique to my society the concept of dowry harassment the concept of eve teasing you you would not have heard of this in westocentric frameworks the concept of you know uh, you know a whole lot of problems that are associated with the indian setup remember we are the ones who gave the world the phrase called love marriage if you ask an american if you tell an american you know something i did love marriage they will look at you stare at you ha uh ha -huh. so is there something called love marriage we all know there is marriage which is based only on love is there love marriage yes we have love marriage we also have one more thing that is called arranged marriage two versions of marriage that is because our society or cultural stratifications are like that and so when a girl stands up and speaks her voice the stereotyped patriarchal mentality of india or the east or the post colonial nation states what do they do from my culture wear jeans then the next comment will be there didn't your parents raise you up in the proper way you are all can you call yourself a cultural kutuvilakku can you call see how patriarchally conditioned stereotypes impact the subject affect the subject these stereotypes three words i will use one is stereotypes one is stigma one is silences how do these stereotypes affect the subject in a post colonial nation state if a woman were to talk about an eve teasing that has happened to her how many houses they will come to her defense in how many homes you will find they will come to her defense the first thing they will do is Hush, don't talk about it then you will not get a good maple you will not get a good husband don't talk about it i'm just being very polished when i talk about eve teasing incidences of violence against women in all ways psychological traumas that a woman goes through is it being redressed in society or is it being sidelined stereotypes that tend to sideline the trauma of the victimized that we have in post colonial nation states so what are these stereotypes if a woman says something it should obviously be false it should obviously be exaggerated like freud says no women are second class citizens these stereotypes have conditioned the man as if he bought her this pair of jeans he gave her that facebook page he grew her up he raised her up he nourished her he cherished her 
somebody from somewhere will come and how stereotypes have resulted in traumatic events not coming out especially you know uh, this confessional poetry you don't find much in right local literature when kamala das came out with her my story you must have seen the backlash that came against it you must have seen the huge backlash that he had to withstand stereotypes stigmas that result in a whole lot of silences and these silences these memories are they archived are they recorded do they go into cultural memory do they go go into the archives this is the third point i'm raising the word archive according to derrida we all know you know an archive is something occurrences of repression a memory you know repressed becomes trauma a memory that is suppressed becomes trauma the more it is deferred the more traumatic it becomes the next you know question that we have is how much of these traumatic events in post colonial nation states are archived you know we have two types of text one is called cultural text and one is called literary text a literary text ah cinema actually be a literary text good when does it become a cultural text when it becomes canonical right when it attains the status of you know uh, being celebrated a cultural text is different from a literary text that is why they say you know when uh, some some of the texts say it is a text worthy of cultural importance a cultural text because of it is being circulated by the mass media circulated by society talked and much discussed in society it gets into the archive it gets into the collective memory it's get it gets into the archives what about the texts that are literary just for the time being they don't get into the archive that is why in his wonderful work archival fever derrida says the archives are filled with violence see the word he uses the phrase he uses the archives are filled with violence that means the the whole lot of post colonial nation states or the subalterns have not been given the due in the archives right archives means what 20 years from now if you, if you have to know something about the status of the nomads in your place you will not find it because it has not been archived and what go to, goes into the archive is the concept of the cultural text and this concept of cultural text you know and the literary text is used by astrid a s t r i d earl astrid earl right she talks about the cultural text that becomes canonical canonical immediate celeb celebrity status shakespeare is canonical milton is canonical they attain canonical status and once it is not represented in the archive that means my voice has been silenced forever and this is the question that plagues literary trauma studies what is that how do you make sure that the voices of the other or the sidelined or the suppressed comes into the mainstream now you know trauma studies is very exclusive exclusive in the sense it is very choosy the framework for trauma studies is not very all encompassing but the need of the hour is to make trauma studies more inclusive to look into the problems the issues of specific cultures in their own terra firma this is more important the problem that i have in my culture will not be the same problem that you have in your culture a problem that a person lives close to the coastal area is not the same as that of a problem a, per, a problem that of a person living in the mountainous area or you know the eskimos they have their individual problems and when you try to 
have an exclusive theory it robs the specifics of the event hippolytain right he gave us the word milieu m i l i e u isn't it in the word milieu he says you know the the specifics of the time need to be taken into account in a study but if tra lit trauma literary trauma studies is very exclusive in its framework it will not go into these specifics what uh, the expression of trauma through songs the reggae the calypsos the jazz the blues how they give vent to the agony the angst and the trauma of the colonized it it has to be included lakshmi kannan has written a wonderful poem called she it's a very you know it's a poem like my grandmother's house filled with nostalgia at the same time it also has a a, a traumatic weave within its spin what is that she says you know i or my identity is determined by how clean my kitchen table is if the kitchen table is not clean speak and span my identity goes for a toss right the gleaming shining tumblers on the kitchen table determine my identity virginia woolf death of a moth she is compared to a moth these incidents a trauma is something that has affected impacted a person emotionally and psychologically if that is the case any incident that has had an adverse effect on anybody's psyche should be traumatic and that means you know giving proper due or mileage or weightage to instances of trauma that have been sidelined that have been relegated and bring those marginalized voices to the mainstream and giving them the due like uh, uh, paul lawrence dunbar says if i will not speak for myself who else will and this will be the ambit that will be stopping epistemic violence on its track this will be the ambit the rubric that will give the archives more a democratic setup and make the archives filled with not a hierarchical setup but an integrative setup that will accommodate all the voices all the voices of the victims be it a transgender i don't know how many of us have known or felt the trauma of a transgender or the you know um, the language of trauma is is another field of study altogether right maybe you know those of you are specializing in trauma studies you can you know work on these facets not necessarily focusing on holocaust or mainstream you know holocaust literary studies or our full respects to you if you work on holocaust literature pranams to you appreciation to you but still there are voices that are underrepresented in trauma studies if we can take those voices into account that are in our own backyard that we can relate to with in our own cultural specifics i think we will be doing a very democratic inclusive trauma literary studies thank you so much thank you rufus sir uh, as we say uh, well begun is half done so i would like to thank rufus sir you know how do we address the trauma of a person uh, who is alienated within the nation right so i was thinking about uh, you know in, in india at present we have this phenomenon of migrant laborers right? in kerala especially we see a lot of migrant laborers who have come from the northern part of india right uh, and i'm sure they also are experiencing a lot of trauma in terms of being alienated we have several incidents that kind so but then how do they articulate their trauma they don't have a language to express their trauma right they don't have the education they don't have that literacy to articulate the trauma that was one i was also thinking about the trauma of envy no how the kind of atrocities that man inflicts on nature 
there is something called the trauma of uh, could you respond thank you ma'am that was a wonderful question actually thought provoking question um the concept of migrant laborers not able able to voice their views in their own nation states like you know uh, it, this problem is there in chennai also only now i think social workers have awakened themselves to the fact that they have to listen to them they say you know most of these laborers were alienated who come down to chennai or to kerala in chennai it's almost you know um, they, they say more than 7 lakh uh, migrant laborers we have right so i don't know about the fact in kerala but uh, these people because they are not given their voice you know they go through untold hardships i am told you know when the metro work was going on more than 100 laborers died because there was nobody to listen to and now i think there is some sensitization that is happening and uh, it needs to be you know really taken up by the government and the ngos right uh, because uh, we can't find uh, creative people amongst them so you can't find artists among them to be expressive of their problems you can't but you can uh, you know uh, have people like artists like us who can delve into their problems right we can do it in our own ways the second question that you asked was about the environment that's a very perceptible very wonderful question because you know the uh, i should use the word if i can use the phrase of eco feminism the 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 land has been ravaged and raped and plundered right it has been ravaged and we need a kind of an eco sensitization that should start right in the classroom j krishna murthy uh, he used to you know i have read all almost all his books i am a great fan of jk he used to say you know he took his students you know in his rishi valley you know he used to take his students to the plants right and he will just take one twig of a leaf just break one twig of a leaf from a plant and he'll make the little students sit around the plants right and he will tell the students look at the plant look at the plant look at the plant like that you know kind of an hypnosis he makes the student look at the plant and he says see one plant one leaf was plucked look at how the plant responds and slowly there will be a, a kind of the plant droops right and he will make them empathize with the plant and the students almost go to the extent of crying and this eco sensitization right that we are my identity is not here but it is in a sense of a larger community that should be cultivated i think as teachers we also have that responsibility as students you know i have seen students do it when they see a plant the first thing they will do is they'll try to break it and then they will try to you know use it as a stick and throw it away how many years it must have taken for a plant to come up this is also again a trauma against nature right uh, the, you know the voiceless again it comes under this obviously right the voiceless the victimized right and i think you know it should come from within uh, not from the outside very good right hope i have answered no the thing is uh, we do talk about environment we do talk about we do talk about environment the kind of damages that we are doing to it and all that but then uh, the land that we use is still centered on the man right we still talk about anthropocentric right it's still anthropocentric yes, yes so do we need to develop a new language to talk obviously, about obviously yes see gender sensitization is uh, you know has become very powerful today if i use the word chairman immediately there will be an attack on me i can't use the word this gender sensitization happened only over a period of time right and we have always used an anthropocentric language on the environment as if you know we don't regard environment as a part of us so we use it right and uh, very soon i think because we are doing a lot of work on eco literature green studies i think there will be a huge sea change right coming up and uh, like trauma studies i think we also should give a lot of thought to environmental studies because it relates right yeah environmental trauma exactly right that is giving voice for the voiceless again so sir first of all thank you for your wonderful presentation and my doubt is that you have talked about uh, several types of knowledge dominant knowledge residual knowledge 
I think uh, it has not described every branches of knowledge um, descriptively, I, I feel. So can you speak about, could you please uh, speak about the residual l l knowledge that you have mentioned and other uh, streams of knowledge? Uh, thank you, sir, for that wonderful question. Residual knowledge, Raymond Williams, actually, you know, he talks about the residual in the sense, remnants or residues, he's very vehement in his attack on religion also. He says, the impact of religion has always been there on culture today, right? The impacts of, you know, the mythological frameworks that we have been observing over the past. Although we think it has gone and out, it is still there in a residual form, in whatever we practice today, in whatever we practice today, it's still in the form of a residue. That is what he says. Remnants of the past. It can be religious observations or religious observances, rituals that you've been practicing in the past. It still is there in every instance of our today. It conditions our today. That is what he calls residual. Yes. It, 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 it has 